Hello, everybody. My name is Erin Glover. I am another one of the fifth generation Glovers. Um, I am new back to the nursery. I had a absence of 10 years and I'm excited to be back. I do have a degree from Utah State University in horticulture. So I know a thing or two because I've been here a while. <laughs> um, you all know Erica. She's um, another Utah State alumnus who is amazingly smart and is here to answer a bunch more questions. Um, last month, you, my sister and Erica were discussing some October planting care, um, tree and shrub care for newly bought, newly purchased items. So some of the things that were discussed last month were how to plant and water your new trees and shrubs properly. The um, difference between telling if a tree or shrub is dormant versus dying, and also the benefits to planting in October, which also carry over into November. So we're gonna start discussing November um, care for the first growing season of any trees and shrubs. And watering is a little different for your plants the first season versus established plants. So Erica, do you wanna to touch on the procedures for new plants, please? Sure. Uh so oftentimes people think that when they have a deciduous tree or shrub that they can just leave it for the whole winter with no extra care. And that's not necessarily true. While deciduous trees and shrubs do go what I would call truly dormant, they completely shut down and stop growing they are still alive. And those roots that are in the soil, if they completely desiccate, if they are so dry that there's no water available anywhere near them, you can have dieback on those roots from just the dryness, the desiccation. And so we do recommend checking at least occasionally, you know, every couple of weeks, if we haven't had any significant precipitation, and just making sure that your deciduous trees and shrubs that you planted this year that have brand new, fresh, little teeny roots, that the soil is at least moist. You're not really watering to give the tree or shrub water because it's not going to be taking in very much, but you don't want those little roots to die back and then perhaps restrict a little bit of the growth that you would have seen otherwise in the coming spring or summer. Um, so just barely damp soil. Uh, if you get out a watering can, all you do is just evenly distribute the water. It's not as much water as you would give to an evergreen tree or shrub. Evergreens, they do slow way down, but they don't go truly dormant. They might not be putting on a ton of growth, but they are still photosynthesizing, they're creating the sugars that they need to continue holding on to their leaves and needles through the winter and into the spring. And so you do need to make sure that your evergreens have enough water available that they don't desiccate. That looks more like a bucket of water rather than a watering can. Uh, the ice method, sorry if the if you hear the plastic from the wind, but our mics are probably okay. Um, we're expecting a storm tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. More snow. Okay, so the evergreens, they do need more water. So you do actually need to put down water for them. The ice method that we've mentioned a couple of times where you just go put some ice cubes on the top of the soil, that would be plenty of water for something that's deciduous, meaning in the winter it has bare branches but that might not be enough water for something that is evergreen. So like this viburnum here is going to be losing its leaves pretty soon, but the laurels, they hang on to their, their leaves all winter. So this plant needs far more water than this one in the winter. So another thing to consider is fully hydrated trees and shrubs, whether or not they're deciduous or evergreen, they have an easier time withstanding extreme temperature changes. And in the fall, when we have these sudden cold snaps where we go from 60s or even 70s on some days, 
And then next week or within the next week, we're supposed to have a high that's, I think, in the 40s, you know, those 39, maybe um, those are the temperature changes that can be difficult because the trees might not have shut down completely yet. And you just want to make sure that they have an opportunity to shut down correctly. And one way that you can do that is make sure that they're watered really well as we go into the dormant season. So that looks like deep soaking, deep soaking with a bucket, deep soaking with a hose. A lot of people might have already put away their hoses for the month. Uh, but a lot of times you have a hose bib that's attached to your house and that water should still flow. If you get out your hose, you should be fine to turn that on and go run water on a tree or shrub. Again, if you have to prioritize anything for winter watering, definitely prioritize your evergreens over your deciduous. But I still recommend checking your deciduous and making sure that they're OK. And part of the reason why it's different for new plantings versus the older plantings is just simply that the root system is so much smaller on a new planting. You don't want to take any chances of putting that tree or shrub through any unnecessary adverse condition. You want to give it the best chance it has. So, yeah, that's... That's some watering advice for a newly planted tree or shrub. And if it's newly planted this year, we would still recommend that the ring, that we recommend the the berm around mm-hmm. where the root ball is placed still be in place. Don't rake that out till next spring. So right. that'll kind of give you a guide, especially if there's not a lot of snow on the ground, where the root ball of the plant would be to, if you take a bucket of water out, <clears throat> where you'd want to specifically water um, because you can't always pull right at the base of the trunk necessarily. Um, But speaking of or helping the roots establish and getting them to have a better root system, root stimulator, um, any fertilizers that you would recommend that are good for newly established trees and shrubs? Root stimulator. Uh, We carry one that's made by the Fertilome company and it's just called root stimulator it's low nitrogen but high phosphorus and phosphorus is one of the nutrients that's needed for root growth Uh, but the point of it is that it has a rooting hormone in it and you can have significant root growth while the ground is not frozen so as long as those little teeny roots can get through the soil they are growing even though it might not be as fast as at other times in the year, you can still have a lot of root growth in these next two months or so before the ground freezes. So I absolutely recommend root stimulator. Um, And the advantage to root stimulator is it's such a mild fertilizer that you can use it on basically anything in your yard. You can use it on things that you have just installed this year, but you can also use it on your existing trees and shrubs. So if you have some in a bottle and you're mixing a bunch, go ahead and pour it on an existing tree that there's no harm done. That tree would probably really benefit from it. So root stimulator is good for both new and existing plantings. On the top, just wondering real quick, do you know off the top of your head how often that can be applied? Like if they, if you apply it in November, even if we were kind of having a nice warmish December, should they apply it again in December or is it I now? Think, yeah, I think it? one application, okay. would, considering the fact that we're in November, one application is probably plenty for this time of year, but you absolutely could start using it again as early as maybe March of next year. And I probably would put it on every month or every other month and you can just keep going until the bottle is empty there's no reason you can't just keep using it okay um so another topic to discuss is wrapping the new tender bark um during winter conditions which new plants would you recommend wrapping um yes and which ones don't need it so There are a couple of different kinds of wrapping and there are a couple of different purposes for wrapping. They kind of accomplish different types of protection. Uh, We did talk a little bit about wrapping last month when we were talking about how to prepare for November. And I made the suggestion to start acquiring the supplies that you would need, like buying the rolls of burlap or the white 
DeWitt, Tree Wrap. Um, but now that we're in November, now is the time to apply those things. If you have not already wrapped your trees and shrubs, you should. Now, part of the, the concern with new plantings is that often these trees and shrubs are in a juvenile state, meaning they haven't matured enough that the bark has started to thicken. The bark is still very tender and it, it damages easily when you rub up against it. You know, it scratches either from kids or dogs or lawnmowers or things like that, but also those trunks are far more susceptible to a kind of winter damage called southwest sunscald. And it's where the south, southwest or west side of the tree trunk heats up in the middle of the day and then we freeze overnight and you start seeing these really significant damaging cracks up and down that side of the tree. And by wrapping with white tree wrap, it works almost like a sunblock. And this, the sunblock helps prevent that side of the tree from warming up enough that the juices start to flow again. Uh, it keeps the trunk in a dormant state so that the cells don't freeze and burst and cause those cracks. So the white tree wrap can be applied to trees and or shrubs that have juvenile bark. And there are some that need it far, like I, I highly recommend wrapping your maples and zelkovas. And there are several other kinds of trees that I absolutely recommend wrapping. And then there are some that don't maybe need it as much as others. They're not quite as susceptible to it. But if you have a question about whether or not your specific tree or shrub should be wrapped with the white tree wrap, then just give us a call or send us an email or something and, and we'll be able to advise you, and let you know whether you should or should not wrap that. Um, but burlap wrap is for a different purpose. Burlap offers physical support for branches that might catch snow load so when we start getting our heavy wet snows this fall, if you have branches that are angled outward just a little bit and they have some accumulation of snow, they start to bend and you can have pretty drastic bends or yeah. breaks or other kinds of things. And that'll go for a lot of different kinds of trees and shrubs, but specifically arborvitae need to be wrapped upright junipers need to be wrapped. And there are even some trees, like maybe if it's a young columnar oak tree, maybe sometimes you would want to wrap a columnar oak tree, especially if it's a kind that hangs onto its leaves over the winter and doesn't drop all of its leaves. Um, but there are a number of reasons why you would want to use burlap wrap. And burlap, you don't wrap the entire thing where none of the leaves are exposed. All you're doing is making a spiral of the burlap. So you're still having some photosynthesis happen on the evergreen trees and shrubs. So all you're doing is offering support. Um, and the burlap usually comes in two different dimensions, two inch width or four inch. And you would just kind of base that off of your, your choice, your decision on which size to buy would be based on what it is you're wrapping and how much physical support you think it needs to have. Um, and I believe our rolls are 200 feet long, so you can get through quite a few of them with a single, yeah. they're, I think they're Re Regan's yeah. waving at me that they're 300 yeah. feet long. So you can get through quite a few and it is reusable. Yeah. So if you're careful when you take it off in the spring, you can keep it for next year and do the same thing. Um, but I definitely recommend wrapping both the white tree wrap on juvenile bark and the burlap on anything that you don't want broken from snow load. So not, not just snowfall, but I've experienced this myself. Um, shrubs and trees that I have planted maybe slightly too close to my roof. And so the snow will slide off and right onto my plants. Mm -hmm. I have some fine line buckthorn that I have to wrap because of where I placed it. And so mm -hmm. just keep that in mind too, not just actual snowfall, but potential snow slide off. So just mm -hmm. something I thought of. Uh, the last topic for the first growing season for trees and shrubs is mulching any tender shrubs, the protecting the grafts, the roots, 
anything else specific that needs to be mulched, what type of mulching and what we mean by mulching. So this is mul <laughs> mulching is something that uh, it's fantastic when it's done correctly, but it can be done incorrectly and cause more problems. And so it's really important that you understand what should be mulched and how um, basically like the young juvenile bark that I was saying can warm up in the, the south and west sun during the daytime. Sometimes if the sun is warming up the soil, it can start to wake up the roots and the roots can have cold damage as well when we go into freezing temperatures overnight. So mulching not only retains moisture in the soil, which we've talked about a hundred times, um, but it helps insulate so that the soil doesn't have as drastic of temperature changes from day to night, day to night, and it helps prevent those roots from waking up at the wrong time. It'll keep them at the right temperature for as long as they need to be until the soil naturally warms up to the temperature it should be in the spring to start waking that tree up. Uh, so mulch offers temperature control, temperature buffing, um, and also the moisture retention. It is important on most trees and shrubs that you not volcano mulch. You don't want the mulch up around the trunk or over the graft because you don't want that graft or, or trunk to rot from the moisture. Usually you would pack as much mulch as you're going to over the root system. You know, anywhere between two and four inches is what we typically advise. But you would always want to take a couple of fingers and clear the mulch away from the trunk just so it's not right up against it. That same thing would go for any of the perennials that tend to rot if they are too wet. You don't want that mulch up against the trunks of the perennials or shrubs like that. But there are some exceptions. Sometimes there are, um, we'll talk about roses as the exception. Sometimes there are roses that are marginally hardy here. If they are not mulched over in the winter, sometimes the graft or the, the canes can freeze in the winter and you might end up losing a rose. We here at our nursery don't typically sell those roses. We prefer to sell the roses that are hardy enough here. Um, but it is possible, like if you live in Park City, that, that maybe you need to mulch over something like that. And you would only use the bare minimum amount of mulch. You don't want to completely mound mulch over a shrub like this. You still want to only do as much as you need to protect it for the winter. And then on occasion, just for fun, some people plant these marginally hardy annuals in their yards, like banana trees or, you know, dahlias or something like that. And sometimes if you put a pile of mulch over that root system, you can keep it warm enough that it has a high likelihood of coming back uh, the next spring. But those are very few and far between exceptions. I would not typically recommend mulching over something other than the roots you you're always safe to mulch over the roots you're not always safe to mulch over the actual structure of the plant so thank you so now we're going to switch to established plants and by established they've had one growing season through the winter yeah, one or, one or more one or more but, yeah mm -hmm. so right now the plants trees and shrubs are <clears throat> officially starting to shut down. So that's where they become dormant. Um, and then we were going to discuss what's happening at a cellular level of, <laughs> of wow. this, but a simple synopsis of cellular level <laughs> yeah. and why, even though we're in November, why December might be something to consider how hard it's going to be on them so that you can start looking for that during this month of November. Mm-hmm. Have fun. <laughs> so <laughs> and go. <laughs> so in in layman's terms, 
trees and shrubs are much like humans or other animals that take certain environmental cues and they sort of naturally understand when it's time for them to go dormant and they base the process of going dormant on things like day length and temperatures so as the you know sunlight is less and less and less and we have more hours of darkness sometimes it'll trigger something in a tree or shrub to go okay now it's time to start shutting down i don't have enough daylight to continue producing as much as i need to in terms of of sugars and whatnot in order to support new growth so this is my this is my cue to start shutting down and sometimes when it's a temperature cue, we don't actually get those temperature cues frequently enough for it to start shutting down based solely on that. So it's kind of a combination of, of things, environmental factors that sort of trigger that. Now, what kind of is happening is the trees and shrubs genetically, they know that water, when it freezes, forms crystal-like structures and it, it ends up having sharp edges and the trees and shrubs slowly force any excess water out of their cells so that they only have the minimum amount of water necessary to support life through the winter. And then what that does is it helps make it so when we do have these warm spells in the winter that those cells, then when we go into the nighttime temperatures, that the cells don't have water inside of them that freezes and creates a sharp edge and punctures cell walls. And so when you have a tree that it has aged enough that it has thick bark, it can do all of that on its own and doesn't need any extra help. But when it's a juvenile tree in a residential landscape where we do have these extreme temperature changes, that's why I keep going back to that southwest sun scald because it can have those changes and it can burst those cells. And just by having that sun block around it, you can really do the tree a favor you can keep it from becoming injured. And that's, I, I mean, for the health of the tree, that's, that's so important to do. So the tree, just like going to sleep in the winter, it waits for the day length, it waits for the warmth in the spring to start waking up. And at that point, it'll start putting more water into those cells and gearing up for spring growth. So it, it knows, it knows when and how to do it, but it's really the amount of water in the cell that changes. Plants are amazing. <laughs> I have a question, you know, not on camera. Is, it, is November the time that because the, the, you're seeing the food stings so much that, that we need to do those extra steps because it can't shut down that food because it would sting? Yes. So just to reiterate, in case anybody didn't hear Regan, because um, she's standing way over there, uh, November is I the month when it's the most important to start taking into account these, these drastic changes because the dormancy, it only goes so far. You're, you go dormant, 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 and then at some point you are dormant and it doesn't, it, the process is as far as it's going to go. And that process takes time. And so if we have these extreme temperature changes in November, early December, before the trees are completely shut down, that's when the most extreme damage can happen is these late fall cold snaps. Um, but it is possible to have damage done in the middle of winter if we have a warm spell, like in January or February. You know, it's not uncommon for us to have a couple weeks that are in the 40s or even 50s. I've, I've seen, you know, 50s sometimes in January and it's crazy. But, um, you know, unpredictable weather, it, you're just kind of doing what you can to help out the trees and make sure that they don't incur any damage that they don't need to. Try to help them act yeah. to winter, kind of like when they yeah. get a new tree. 
<laughs> and you want it to acclimate to to spring, we're also helping it acclimate to winter. So we're just yeah. doing what we can. And actually, aspect. acclimation is something to talk about. A lot of these trees and shrubs, if they're new plantings, they came from a place like Oregon or Washington, and their schedule might be different than mm -hmm. ours. They might not go dormant until later than we do because we're at a higher elevation. We're right next to these really, you know, um, like the granite peaks sometimes with our snowstorms and things. A plant that has been grown in a different part of the country might not, it, it might struggle to adapt to our calendar here in Utah. And so by wrapping, you're just helping it to get used to Utah weather a little bit faster. Yeah. <laughs> Changes every five minutes, right? Yeah. Um, so we've discussed most of this. I'm going to step down to disease and pest prevention protocols, actually, because we discussed the wrapping. Okay. But um, so November, since the soil is still relatively um, thawed, not frozen, so we're still be able to add water. Now's a great time to add some systemic fertilizer, systemic um, insecticide. Systemic just means that it's going to move throughout the tree from the roots through the entire tree. It helps prevent a lot of diseases next year. Specific diseases or specific anything you want to discuss for right now? Yeah, most of the time you want to clean up the debris too, but that's because they, they are typically... Um, harbors for fungal infections or bacterial infections, usually fungal, but uh, that's something that you would treat for at this time of year as well, fungal infections. Um, so if you have a tree that has dropped a lot of leaves or a shrub or something that you know had a disease this year, make a point to clean up all of the leaves do your best to pick them up and put them in trash rather than compost. You don't want to compost and keep all of that disease in your yard. You want to get rid of it. Um, but yeah, the systemics can be really beneficial at this time of year. Absolutely. Fungicides, insecticides. Yeah, there are lots of different things. Yeah, I actually just did mine last weekend. Um, and it's super easy. I did... I want to say 10 trees and it took me 20 minutes. So it's not, it is not time consuming. And even, so if you don't know what disease or pest that your tree had, but you know it had something wrong with it, like Erica said, for sure clean up those leaves. Um, I just want to touch down on that again because that fungus will spread. <laughs> We've yeah. had a lot of issues with that. So, And then when it comes to some last minute pruning, um, any, any recommendations whether or not now is a good time? Are there specific trees or shrubs that you would recommend not pruning right now? I know that roses are the number one question that I personally get about yeah. is now a good time to prune your roses and I have four in my yard that are still blooming. So, yeah. <laughs> so specifically about roses, at this time of year, I wouldn't do anything other than deadhead. I wouldn't take down any height. I wouldn't thin them out. I would only do the bare minimum amount of pruning that you absolutely have to do before the snow flies. Um, that being said, if it's a well-established rose, you probably aren't going to do significant damage if you need to do some more serious pruning right now. But the best time of year to prune roses, either by thinning or reducing the height of a shrub or, you know, kind of structural pruning sort of things. The best time is in the spring when the new buds on the sides of the cane start to swell and show some color. That would be the ideal time to do your significant rose pruning. Um, and that, it, I mean, the timing for that kind of falls back into the whole going dormant thing. If you do any significant cuts on roses after, say, the middle or end of August, it triggers the rose to keep producing mm -hmm. new blooms 
and it doesn't always shut down on the schedule it's supposed to shut down. And so you don't really want to trick the rose and and tell it that it has more time than it really does. So that's why they say don't really do any pruning on roses past the middle or end of August because you want to give the roses enough time to recognize those environmental changes and shut down on the correct schedule. So roses, barely pruning, if at all, I would probably not prune if you can get away without doing it. Um, and for trees and shrubs, I, going back to the snow load thing, I probably wouldn't prune anything unless you absolutely need to. If you're afraid of a branch that's going to be too close to your roof line or something like that, if it has snow load on it, do what you need to do, but sparingly. This is not the best time of year to prune. To um, prune live branches. Live branches. I just, yeah, Once, dead, you can always prune. Yeah. If it's dead, you can take it out any time of year, like Erin was just saying. But the best time to prune a tree is while it's completely dormant, once it has gone all the way to that point of being dormant, um, or right as it's waking up in the spring. So if we do get one of those warm spells in the middle of the winter, that's sometimes a really good time to go out and do your tree pruning because usually the trees don't wake up at that point. Uh, you can do any of your significant cuts in the middle of winter when it is more physically comfortable for you as a human to be outside climbing trees. Hopefully you're not climbing unsafely. Um, but right as those leaf buds start to swell in the spring would be the ideal time to cut deciduous trees. If it's an evergreen tree, it's a pretty similar schedule. You would want to wait until you start to see the new growth flush. And then at that point is when you could make any changes you need to. Generally speaking, you don't prune evergreens, but it is sometimes necessary to do that. Um, but sometimes that schedule is a little bit later than it is on deciduous trees. Like you might not start to prune evergreens until middle of April or end of April when you start seeing that new growth where the deciduous trees might be March, early March. So just keep an eye on those things. Um, and just coming back to the original question, only do what you have to do right now. If you can wait, you should wait. So spring blooming shrubs, so early spring, forsythia, mm -hmm. they basically right now have already set their blooms for next year. Correct. So if you know that you have a shrub that's, <clears throat> when we say early blooming, we're going to say March, April. And even into May. May. So those I would not prune right now. Let them flush out, let them bloom next year, and then after they're blooming next year, then prune them. So do not prune the spring blooming shrubs right now. Correct. That was one of my reasons for and against. <laughs> yeah, right. Also, if it's something that blooms on new wood versus old wood, like some of the hydrangeas, mm -hmm. you'd want to make sure you know which kind of hydrangea you have or at least pay attention to your hydrangea and figure out whether it's new or old wood because that can change the time of year that you would prune it. Yeah. So we were just discussing pruning evergreen and kind of evergreen care. So I want to touch on wilt proof because <clears throat> now so a wilt proof is an anti-transparent, mm -hmm. which is really important for quite a few evergreens. I'm going to point out specifically Arborvita because they are, I want to say, the number one thing that, number one evergreen that is affected by our winters here, even though they do really well, they do need a little help the first two to three years. And one of the best ways to help Arborvita is to spray with an anti-transparent. We carry Wiltproof. It's not terribly hard to apply. Um, we have ready to use, we have concentrate. You spray it on the needles until it's kind of dripping off but not running and you want to explain how the wilt proof helps 
the arborvita and other evergreens with our with their first winter here in Utah. <laughs> Again, you, good luck. You want to get into this on a cellular level, no, I guess? No, we'll, we'll do a layman's No, because term. my battery is lighting. So, <laughs> so okay, we, we'll we got we'll to do layman's term. battery. But basically, humans respirate, plants transpirate. It's their way of breathing. And while they breathe, much like humans, they lose a little bit of water vapor and that negative pressure is actually what pulls the water in through their roots. So an antitranspirant intentionally with an organic material clogs those pores, the stomata, so that the plant does not lose as much moisture as it would otherwise, and it helps maintain the moisture inside of the plant rather than losing it to our cold winter winds and having desiccation damage. And so um, it's a it's a temporary thing. It wears off after a few weeks, you know, six, eight weeks or so. So really, you'd want to put it on sort of end of November into early December to help with the coldest part of the winter. And, and again, arborvitae are probably the worst offenders, but you can spray it on just about any evergreen, including laurels. So broadleaf evergreens <laughs> also could benefit from an anti-transparent. That'll be boxwoods, euonymus, et cetera, et cetera. So please come see us for Wilt Proof. It's a great product. It really will help. Yeah. Lastly, we're just going to discuss plants that maybe you didn't get the chance to plant, so they're still in your in a container how to help them winter over. It's what we do here at the nursery. I, I mean, either one of us can really talk about it, but to help them uh, winter through, we actually combine them into a couple of big groups. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you want to discuss the reasoning sure. for it. So Yeah. So I've mentioned a couple of times that soil and moist soil specifically are insulators. They help keep a root system warm. And a plant that is in the ground is far more protected than a plant that is out of the ground in a container. And so what we do for those plants that are a little bit on that tender, you know, borderline, what we do is here in the nursery, we slide all of those pots very close together and we put some bark like a, a soil pep sort of product, a mulch of some kind up against the side of the containers to help protect it from the cold winds. Um, but it's not the, the best solution. The best solution is just get it in the ground while you can, while you can still work the soil with a shovel, just put it in the ground. It would be the ideal situation. And just pulling something into the garage for the winter doesn't always work because sometimes they still need light. And if it's in the garage, they're not going to be able to photosynthesize the way that they need to in the middle of the winter. And you could end up doing more damage that way too because the temperature isn't as cold as it should be for those plants. So... Um, and if it's a heated garage, which some people do yeah. have, it actually could cause it to start to want to grow when it's exactly. supposed to be sleeping. So yeah, plant your trees if you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not the best scenario to have your plants in containers, but sometimes you don't have another choice. So mulching around the containers is an option. You do still need to check the moisture levels in the, in the containers. We do water here in the winter. We drag the hoses around even when it's just barely a freezing temperature and we make sure that everything gets watered, all of our conifers, all of our laurels and many other plants. Um, so it is important that you not drown them but they do need to be watered and they'll need more, they'll need more frequent watering if they're in a container than if they were in the ground. So you'll probably need to check it weekly, but you might not need to water it weekly. Um, I don't know if we have anything else, Regan, that you want to touch on. I thought everything was really last minute November. 
November tidbits. We have some rain and hopefully snow. Yeah, I actually wrote down our day temperature is going to range in the next um, 14 days from the high of 64, which is today, and the lowest day temperature is 39. And then our nights are going from anywhere from 27 to 44. So just a heads up for anybody who um, maybe has a few extra plants that they need to get in the ground. You, you've got some really good days coming up to be able to still dig. And um, make sure you get a good last watering in. I know we discussed it in October. I just want to hit on it again. Even if you've taken your hose off of your bib, I would still, it's a great day today to go out, get a five gallon bucket, and anything that's been recently planted this year, I would give it that nice um, one last deep soaking. I don't even like to use the word last. All right, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, one more, sorry, one more deep soaking right now while the weather is still really decent and you're able to get out and wear a nice little sweater and <laughs> not be trenching in snow. That actually but, is one question that I have because I know we talk yeah. about it over and over, but it's, it's something people don't hear until they hear it. And so I just want to reiterate, you talked about Establishment watering in November, what that looks like for trees and shrubs. Established watering. Establish, establishment establishment water. water newly planted. I, I, if we had to boil it down to a guideline, I would say you need to be checking at least weekly. Yeah, I was going to say once a week. And you probably are going to need to water every week and a half or two weeks. Um, if we do this again in November with our temperatures, it's possible that you might need water more often than that. But you don't ever want to get to a point where you think you might be rotting the roots by watering too much. It is absolutely possible to water too much and kill your plants from overwatering. So especially if you have clay soil, you need to be mindful of that because the clay does not drain as well as sandy soil. And you might need to water more frequently if you have sandy soil. So please just go and check. And how you check, how you best check is to move around a little bit of the soil to the side and check a few inches deep and see how wet it is to the touch. If it's on the dry side, it might be time to pour a bucket of water on it. So check it check it weekly for sure, and then water as needed. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, you guys, are, you ladies are awesome. So. Great job. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else to say other I, than. I have one last thing I thought of. <laughs> um, and it wasn't really last minute because I have it right here on oh. the table. Um, <laughs> last topic. Soil compaction. Mm. If at all possible, don't dig or drive over or walk over really, really wet, saturated soil. That is the worst time for soil health, soil structure. So you can do a lot of damage to the soil if you're working it when it is super wet. Um, so if you are going to plant a tree or shrub, it would be best to do it on a day that we have not necessarily received rain so that the soil is only moist. Um, or even on the dry side, that would be far better for the soil health than to dig in mud. The mud can create a lot of compaction. So just throwing that out there, your soil is alive, don't kill it. That's it. <laughs> That's a great way to end. No, we'll, we'll, uh, if you have questions, post them in the comments. We'll put some polls and, and different themes. Let us know. I don't think they can hear me. Um, okay, so if you have any questions, comments, please post them in the comments section. We will, we will respond yeah. as, as possible. We will be trying to follow up. We will be following up with some supplemental, supplemental information, some little homework tips, tricks, questions. And as always, if you have any questions, please give us a call and uh, email. We do have, it's on our, all of, everything's on the website, all of our email addresses. And Erica has her lovely office hours for this class Wednesdays from, from 10, 10 to, to 2. 10 to noon. <laughs> 10 to noon. We're 10 close. to noon, sorry. Close. 10 to noon, noon, 10 to 12. 
Um, I'll, I'll be here at the nursery, so you can either just stop in, or if for some reason that timing doesn't work for you, just get in touch with us, and I can make some other arrangements with you. We can make something work. So, But thank you right. for welcoming me to the group, and I'll see you soon. Have a wonderful <laughs> November. Yeah, <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Oh, Pumpkin, oh, pumpkin smash. smash, pumpkin smash, November 5th at, from 10 to 2. There's a lot of activities, um, for children. We have different, different activities. I, I don't know if I can list them all. And like the pumpkin, pumpkin smash, where they whatever. drop it onto a target. Super fun. Please, please come. We do, we do have a covered area. It might rain, but we do have a covered area we're going to participate in. So it's, it is really fun. And, I will be here. <laughs> I probably will be here. But we're doing a food drive also. Very important. So we're accepting donations for the Utah Food Bank. Please bring something. Um, you know, we've got big barrels set up to collect the food. So if for no other reason, come stop by, drop off a few cans of something or another and that would that yeah. would be really helpful. Some exciting news when you donate to the food bank food bank. We have free house plants that uh, you can receive for for your donation um, until we run out. <laughs> yeah. But we do have quite a well, few left, and left. so your generosity, you do get something back, which, you know, is great. And there are some really beautiful house plants that I wish I could take home, but I have no great window. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first yeah. house for house plants. <laughs> but a great yard. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a good day. Bye, Thank everybody. You.